All right. So I am Lucie Lavinière. I'm the president of Interactive Ontario. First thing I have to tell you, welcome, because we haven't done an eye lunch since March 2020. And obviously it's because of COVID. Uh, we basically pivoted our priorities uh, to adapt to what was very important to the industry. But now it's time to restart our regular programming in addition to everything else we've been doing uh, with the industry over the last few months uh, to uh, basically recover and still try to grow out of COVID, uh, out of the COVID crisis. So I launch, uh, many of you already know that, but it's a series, it's almost a monthly series. And its goal is to provide you with insights that you would not easily find elsewhere. So we bring in experts, thought leaders, people that have hands-on experience with a topic uh, and you can engage uh, with uh, these people. By the way, Sarah, uh, do we have the Discord today or that's going to be for our next island? Well, mute, mute. Oh, thank you. No, not today. We're going to okay. um, keep the Zoom chat for today and then Discord will be next island. All right. So, so we're going to use Discord more and more, but as Sarah said, and not today, uh, but that's going to be uh, a very important part of connecting people across the province in our industry. So first off, I have to also say a big thank you to Ontario Creates. Uh, Ontario Creates is our presenting partner for iLaunch. Uh, they have been for many years, so we really appreciate their support. Without uh, Ontario Creates, uh, there wouldn't be any iLaunch series, so thank you very much. So today, uh, we're very, very lucky to have Insert Coin uh, with us. Uh, because the topic of uh, accounting and structuring uh, your company, your project for funding and tax credit is very important. Uh, as I'm sure many of you have realized, uh, it's great that we're a creative industry, but we also need that business savvy to help us through funding uh, and reporting back to uh, funders or to the tax credit. Uh, and we have with us the two co-founders of Insert Coin today, Matthew Ma Wallach and uh, Mudassir Mahoud. Uh, Mudassir, I didn't pronounce your name probably, so it's Mudassir Mahmoud. That's right, uh, yeah. So I'm sorry about that. So they're both very, very engaged in the industry. And Anna Short from Insert Coin is also with us today. Uh, she's in charge of engagement and she's been instrumental in organizing this with Sarah and Stephanie today. So very, very quickly, uh, I'm just going to highlight some very interesting points out of the bios of Matthew and Mudassir. So Mudassir, in addition to being an expert accountant, also does coding and design. So I didn't know that, so I'm very intrigued now. Uh, but over the last 10 years, uh, Mudassir has worked in the gaming industry and interactive digital media clients across Canada. Uh, and basically, Mudassir, you know pretty much everything, accounting-wise, tax filing, compliance, assurance, strategic financial consulting, tax credit, grant preparation. So... Mudassir is going to be a very important point of contact for you for all things accounting and tax related. Matthew, uh, Matthew, I didn't know that about Matthew, but uh, Matthew spent half of his career uh, in Fortune 500 companies. And then about 10 years ago, decided that uh, he wanted to focus on the gaming and interactive digital media industry. Uh, and like Mudassir, Matthew has worked with hundreds hundreds of clients in the industry over the last 10 years uh, in terms of public and private funding, uh, strategic planning for maximizing uh, your return. Uh, so, and as Bayo says, Matt will be your point of contact for pretty much any, everything else. Uh, so both of them are experts and we're lucky to have them. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to you too. Thank you, Lucy, uh, and thank you for having us. Um, 
Really appreciate that. Hopefully we can give you uh, some points of value here to really get you uh, understanding how tax and accounting relate specifically specifically to gaming. That's kind of why we got into this side of the business because uh, as we all know, gaming is very different than tech. And what we found was that a lot of accounting companies, a lot of general accountants kind of chopped the two in the same group. Um, perhaps tech speaking, there's some similarities there, but from a financial perspective, it couldn't be farther from the truth. So uh, Lucy, appreciate the the bio and the intro. I actually was going to do something uh, a little bit similar myself, so I'll cut it short here. But essentially, it's it's just the breakdown of really why we started this and, and what that background is. Hannah, we're probably going to have to update that because it's actually 15 years now. So that's probably uh, a profile that we've we've set up five years ago, I would assume. But my background, as Lucy uh, alluded to, was in some Fortune 500. But when I got into this industry, I really got into the tax credit side of the business and. The company that we started back then was focused across industries, but I really focused on the uh, gaming side itself. And it was about five years into that where we realized, and we had a lot of gaming clients coming to us and asking for advice because they didn't really, their accountants didn't really understand the gaming spectrum. Uh, at the time we brought aboard Modesto to that uh, prior company and Modesto and I kind of had this idea to shoot out and, and just tackle tax in gaming. But even more than that, what Modesto really wants to do is break the mold of accounting. And we've kind of married the two together. By break the mold, what I meant is he was looking at what traditional accounting was. So Monday's background was in a lot of company, uh, traditional accounting firms, and also with the Auditor General's office, uh, where he could see what was going on in the inner workings and really how archaic and paper-based accounting really was. And all this tech was coming around, these cloud-based technologies that were really relevant to uh, accounting and specifically to accounting within gaming, because it really suited the industry well when it came to, to project-based accounting. So two of us got together about six years ago and decided to launch this company. We were silly enough not to brand it as a gaming company, a gaming accounting practice early on, but three years ago, we rebranded it to Insert Coin so we could stop explaining to people that we just did accounting. I'll turn it over to Modessa. Great. All right, so that was a good intro. So it looks like we're gonna jump right into it. Um, so the topic obviously is money and any discussion about money, the most important thing is how do I get money into my gaming studio? So fortunately, because we're in Ontario and Canada, we have a few options here in terms of getting some help to get your studio set up. So what we're gonna be doing now is starting off, talk, just talk about a couple of those options. So the most common, or I guess the biggest fund in Canada is the CMF, the Canada Media Fund. Uh, if you're in the gaming or arts industry, you must have heard of them. Essentially, what it's, it's a federal uh, program and it's administered by telephone. So the CMF is the name of the program or the fund. And then all of the staff and the application happens through telephone. They're actually another uh, federal agency that deals with uh, more of the film and TV credits. Uh, but again, they're administering the entire program. So all of the staff you're going to be dealing with is Telephone Canada. Um, so the way the funding is structured is uh, they fund on a per project basis. So they, they don't actually fund your entire company. It's based on a project. So you have to pitch, what you're doing is pitching your project to CMF and they support up to 75% of your project budget uh, up to certain dollar value limits. But it's, it's common to see funding over a million dollars across the lifetime of the project. Uh, the way the funding is structured could be either as a, an advance or what they could do is if, if your project is in the production stage, they get in as an investor into the project. So they provide funding and in return, they take a cut of the, the revenue of the project. Uh, and the way it goes, usually the standard terms are about seven years. So they once they collect back their initial funding amount, they get a quarter of your profits for up to seven years. Uh, the way the funding is structured is, is different stages. So you can get different amounts and different terms of funding depending on where your project's at. So conceptualization is kind of a newer program that was just introduced in the last couple of years. It essentially gives you money just to uh, figure out the ideation stage of your project, just uh, formalizing the idea, proof of concept kind of thing. Uh, and it's a small fund. It's about $15,000. That's the maximum. Uh, the next stage is the prototyping. So these are pretty much going in order. You can kind of figure out what that would involve. It's just kind of a working demo of your game. Uh, again, it's usually a couple of years at the most in terms of um, the duration. And the type of funding is, again, in advance. 
And if your project goes past the prototyping and enters production stage, that advance gets converted into an investment. And then the additional investing comes in at that point as well. And again, like I mentioned, that's where the CMF participates in your profits from this game. Uh, and again, the production, uh, they can fund up to 75% of the project. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's people, let's say people are pretty opinionated about CMF and their roles because of that uh, revenue share aspect of it. So that's something to keep in mind. Now on the provincial side, um, Ontario Creates has something called the Interactive Digital Media Fund or IDM Fund. Uh, again, this is a provincial program that's uh, administered by Ontario Creates. And what they provide, they provide a, a bit of, this program is a bit different from CMF in that it, they provide kind of uh, just a straight contribution to your projects. So that means there's no repayment or there's no uh, profit sharing involved. Uh, but the catch is that they only fund up to 50% of your project. So the other 50% you're required to come up with for using other sources, which could include CMF. So it's possible to have uh, both CMF and IDMF fund a project. However, there's obviously, it gets pretty complicated when you have two uh, large similar funds involved. And there are a few caveats there in terms of who gets to be the last or the final funder. Usually Ontario creates likes to be the final participant in financing. So you need to ensure that all your other sources are finalized before you go to Ontario Creates. Uh, in terms of project stages, again, kind of similar breakdown. You have your concept definition and production stages, uh, kind of the earlier stages of the project. And then they have a separate fund for marketing as well as uh, kind of like an export fund almost. It's called the Global Market Development. Uh, again, that gives you funding for, uh, I guess, more so towards like trade shows and conferences. I guess this is more relevant in a pre-COVID world. Um, of course, now it's everything's, as far as we can tell, is virtual. So again, that, that fund might be a bit tricky now just to uh, get those costs for like travel and conferences. Uh, the last program is the IRAP, the Industrial Research. And it's kind of like the odd one out. Um, <laughs> Maybe Matt, you can talk about that a bit more. Sorry, I actually was just clearing my throat. I didn't mean that as anything otherwise. Uh, but even before I get into that, I just want to say this is meant obviously the CMF and, and IDMF um, portion here that we're discussing is a general overview of how they're structured. Uh, depending on the level of people's um, aptitude when it comes to these programs and and where you're, what stages you're at in gaming, I realize that there probably are some questions that we can definitely discuss in the, in the Q&A period with regards to treatment of CMF uh, when it comes to tax time, because that is a, a big issue when it comes to claiming tax credits in relation to CMF. Also, another hot button that's been coming up in the past couple of years and more and more recently is this whole idea of the 100% threshold of government funding and how that interacts with CMF, IDMF tax credits, because it's, it's pretty easy to go above that 100% that threshold. And we're seeing a lot of, of change happening and coming directly from CMF on that side. So I definitely like to discuss that in the Q&A. If people know what I'm talking about and want to, want to discuss that further, we'll go there. Um, IRAP is one thing we want to chat about here briefly, because it is something that we see uh, widely unknown in gaming uh, and that's uh, that's unfortunate because IRAP is a program that should be taken advantage of. It is truly uh, the R&D grant that's out there. A lot of people look at Shred and think about it as the R&D program. We'll talk about that in a second, but IRAP is that, that true innovation program and it's on a grant basis. Uh, what I love most about the IRAP program is I have seen a lot of companies successfully claim it in gaming. Uh, those that are doing something like extending an engine, um, working on some um, uh, some next-gen consoles that are, have a lot of unknowns and are looking to commercialize on additional technology on top of that. Uh, the best part about IRAP is it's not a lengthy application. It's largely an, a relationship-based program. So you're assigned an ITA to your account and essentially you're selling this tech, not the game, but this tech that you're building to that person and they become a champion for you. And they'll grant you between fifty and $100,000, which may not be a lot, but it's non-co-payable, um, sorry, non-repayable and non-co-funded. So it truly is a grant. $100,000 was the old threshold through uh, NAFTA up until last year. So that's what that threshold is there for. So I do encourage you to take a look at it. Um, any further questions about that? We can definitely discuss those. 
So we want to chat a little bit about the tax credits here. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the OIDMTC. Uh, OIDMTC is Ontario's uh, digital media tax credit. Most provinces have a similar program. Um, it is something that Lucy and I and a lot of people in the industry have been discussing it at length over the past six, seven months because we are looking to create some change on it. But again, it's a provincial-based program. It also is administered by Ontario Creates. Um, the one thing that we're all discussing here a lot recently is this idea between project completion and annual filing. So it is one of the few programs that does still uh, file on a project completion basis, which means you have to be releasing your game and it's in that year that you can claim the tax credit. Now that's if your spend in the year is under $500,000. So the threshold used to be a million dollars. It was just changed down to $500,000 in this past year. So that does open it up to, to some mid-size companies, but we also recognize there are a lot of uh, indie, indie studios out there that are spending far less than $500,000 and could uh, benefit from getting that pro that's money uh, a lot sooner than the end of the project. Another thing that is unique to the Ontario program is this 80-25 rule, and it is something that uh, I will discuss here briefly because those who aren't aware of it definitely need to be aware of it. It's something that can essentially uh, submarine your project and your eligibility for funding before it even starts. So the whole concept there is that 80% of your funding, 80% of your labor spend on the project must be done in Ontario. A couple of other important points about that are that 25% of that labor spend must be on salaries. Now, lesser known aspects of the 80-25 are that of that 20% that is ineligible, of course, it can't be spent, it can be spent in elsewhere in Canada, internationally, but what people aren't always aware of is that this whole concept of multi, uh, multi-person corporations. So if you contract out your art, your sound, to a corporation that employs more than one person, that amount of the labor that you're spending on the project now counts in that 20% against the project. So it's something to definitely keep in mind uh, as you're, you're creating this project, as you're, you're uh, budgeting your spend for the project. I could talk for three hours on OIDMTC. So anybody want to chat later on or offline, let me know. What I do want to talk about here is the shred program because I, I still see far too few, far too few, I don't know if that's right, uh, studios looking at shred uh, in the industry. And that's because, again, something I alluded to in the last slide in the sense that a lot of people look at the shred program as the innovation program, the R&D tax credit, and that is simply not the case. Take a look at the second part of that word right there. Scientific research, that is your research, fine. But experimental development is exactly what it sounds like. It's experimentation, it's iteration. Um, the way I, I typically explain it in the most layman's terms possible is that it's when you're working on uh, anything at a code level that doesn't have an obvious solution to it. And that's pretty much all coding. It's rare that you're coding something out and you know exactly how to do it and it works. It's rendered on screen, perfect performance right from the get-go. That makes it sound like everything qualifies. That's not truly the case because it doesn't <laughs> be seated in tech. But really what we want to do here is take a look at it from that higher level and then break it down. So I do encourage you to think about Shred from that perspective. When were you trying to solve something that you didn't have an obvious solution to and when were you doing that with code? It's a federal-based program. So this is not Ontario, it's based uh, Across Canada, each province has a top-up. Ontario has a moderate top-up of 10%. Um, it is also a fiscal-based program. So we're looking at this as an annual filing. So in contrast to the OIDMTC, it does make sense when you're eligible to file for both because you're getting one, a higher rate from Shred, and two, you're actually getting it on an annual basis at the end of every year based on the work that you did. Tax credits also have financing available with them. Um, Bit different here. Uh, it's one time, the only time I will talk about Quebec. Uh, we do work across Canada, but it's the only time I'll talk about Quebec in this uh, session. Uh, Quebec has a really interesting model where the government actually finances their tax credits. It's something we'd love to see here. I think it'd be an, an excellent way to get money into the hand of developers quicker, um, especially when there's, there's a bit of a, a queue for these tax credit programs compared to Quebec. Now, having said that, the queue has come down quite a bit with Ontario Creates, so um, it's in the 10 to 12 week range right now. If you're looking to finance these credits, even if you're not, I recommend that you set up um, parameters or, or, or relationships early on so that you're not stuck with going with uh, some of these, what I would call predatory private lenders that really just seek to, to uh, finance things like Shred and OIDMTC. They're looking at credit card interest rates, they're looking at uh, lengthy minimums, and you could be paying a hefty uh, portion of your credit to them. There are two banks, luckily, though, in Canada that will finance against tax credits. And if you have a relationship with them, that's excellent. If you don't, perhaps reaching out to them ahead of time does make sense. But that's RBC and National Bank. Um, 
when just establishing that because those are the two banks that really do understand this industry and will happily lend at, at favorable bank rates instead of predatory uh, interest rates for these credit programs. I think the obvious question after looking at that last slide would be, can I claim for both, can I file for both tax credits? Ah, good question. Right? Uh, <laughs> the, you're not gonna like the answer in Ontario. <laughs> Which yeah. is, you can file for both credits in a given year, but you can't claim the same expenditure. You can get tax credit, both tax credits on the same expenditure, I guess is the right answer. So this is uh, probably the common thing across most provinces, with the exception of Quebec again, is that where you can claim both tax credits on the same expenditure, but you can only, if something qualifies for shred, you claim it for shred, and anything that doesn't qualify for shred, you claim under OIDMTC. And why that makes sense or why that's pertinent to discuss is you want to make sure that you're budgeting and structuring it so that you're taking a look at, at where you're maximizing the return. And frankly, it's not, it's not always shred because on shred, you're getting a higher rate for employees and about half that for contractors, whereas on OIDMTC, you're getting this, the 40% across the board. So if most of your labor is contracted, then OIDMTC might be the better route, but we want to make sure that you're looking at that kind of ahead of time and, and able to budget for it. Because in truth, these are both entitlement programs. And entitlement programs mean if you're doing eligible work, you're entitled to that money. There's no cap set on either one of these programs. Yeah. All right, so that was kind of a quick 101 level overview of tax credits and funding. I guess now we're kind of moving into, I guess you could say 201 territory with just a bit more depth into some of these things. Uh, so we, this is something where I guess what we learned over the years, we can kind of share that with some of you in terms of once you are getting funding, what are the things I need to watch out for? And I think the first thing, the question that's pertinent is, Okay, so CMF or IDM fund are funding 50 or 70% of the project. Where do I get the other half or the other percentage, right? Uh, so there's a couple of ways you can kind of fill that gap. Uh, the most common strategy we've used, we've seen used is salary deferrals. Um, and that's essentially where you are foregoing a portion of your salary uh, in order to basically as your contribution to the project. So if you would be getting paid, let's say $50,000 a year as let's say the lead developer, you as a founder of the company are deciding, deciding to forego that salary or maybe reduce that salary. And that portion is now your contribution. It's like your equity, sweat equity into the, into the project. Uh, and that is a valid form of uh, contribution to the project. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Uh, other than deferrals, the other strategy is obviously tax credits. So uh, for example, uh, in the case of IDM fund, Ontario Creates recognizes that the OIDMTC is a, a source of financing for a project. However, they do require that uh, you provide some kind of basis for that contribution. So let's say if your project uh, hypothetically was $100,000 and you get 40% of that uh, in eligible OIDMTC at the end of the project. Obviously that's uh, some time out until you get that money because you don't get it until the project is completed. So what uh, you can do is put in 40,000 as kind of the contribution. However, in most cases, because of the timing differences, you are required to get some kind of uh, interim financing or get some kind of assurance that from a tax credit consultant that that is the amount that you're entitled to receive. Uh, obviously it's an estimate at this point. And the other option obviously is financing of even shred or multimedia tax credits. So yeah, I think someone asked for uh, the last, just the end of the last part. So yeah, so when you are, uh, when you're presenting your project proposal okay. to CMF or IDMF, uh, they okay. you are required to present some kind of a breakdown of the project, like how you plan to fund this project, right? Because IDMF is only covering 50% of the project. So yeah, the whole point about the contribution. So again, it's figuring out how to get the other part of the other rest of the project financed. And in that instance, you can use tax credits or anticipated tax credits as a source of funding for the project, even though you're gonna get them after the project is completed. Uh, in most cases, Ontario Creates does accept that as a viable funding source, as long as you can, you might need to finance it in some cases or get some kind of assurance from a tax credit consultant that that is the estimated amount. Uh, Mudasi, I just want to ask a question. You mentioned the fact that people may need to bridge finance 
uh, whether it's deferral or the tax credit. Uh, and you know, can you explain that people do have to prove by doing a cash flow that they can finance it? Can you talk a bit about this? Sure. So as when you're submitting your initial budget, so there is a, a monthly cash flow breakdown as well that's required. So obviously the tax credits wouldn't be a part of the project life cycle because they're after the fact in most cases. Uh, same with salary. Well, salary deferrals doesn't need to be because that's not an actual cash outflow. Uh, it's just a part of the salary just being deferred. Uh, so there's no requirement to finance that. It's just a signed letter from uh I guess whoever the person, the employee who's deferring the salary, just uh, a written commitment from them that says that, okay, I do agree to defer $40,000 of salary or whatever mm. over the lifetime of the project. Is that required? Sorry. The deferral? No, that's an option. That's an option to make up your contribution. I mean, like the signed letter, is that a requirement for a deferral? Yes, that, that's in the IDM fund guidelines. So they do require that signature, like a signed letter up front. And that's for the fund itself? That's not like a legal thing? No, no, that's not a legal thing. That's just for the purposes of financing. Uh, and I think some people in the chat are mentioning that for CMF, uh, that has to be a shareholder that defers. Um, it can't be just a non-shareholder employee. So that's a good point. I think Lucy, you were asking though about um, the ability to bridge, right? So so uh, it is true. Uh, is it is it, um, but I'm not sure, is it mandatory that uh, people show their bank funds, uh, allow them the ability to bridge? I know that that's commonly what we've seen, but I'm not sure if that's, uh, if that's mandatory or not. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I know you are required to submit a, uh, like a statement or a letter from your banks saying you have those funds available yeah. for the, uh, because there's also a 10% cash contribution that's required, right? So you can't have the entire 50% be deferrals. Uh, so there's still a 10% of the project that's cash so uh, that they do require some kind of bank statement or bank confirmation to show that. Uh, as for the tax credits being financed, I'm pretty sure I'll have to check on that. I'm not 100% sure. I can look into that. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so going back to budgeting. So a couple of things to watch out for when you're, budget, when you're submitting your budget. So the audit and review fee. Uh, again, that's, uh, there's still a cost associated with audits and reviews, uh, especially in cases where your project budget exceeds certain thresholds. So if your project is over $500,000, the total cost, you are required to prepare, submit an audited cost statement for the project once the project wraps up. Uh, and if your project budget is between two hundred fifty and $500,000, then you are required to submit a review engagement, which is kind of like a, a, a lightweight less, audit. Li yeah, yeah a light, a lightweight <laughs> audit basically is what it is. So there are fees associated with these engagements. And usually you have to hire an independent audit firm, like a licensed auditing firm to conduct the audit or review for you. And there's a cost associated with that. So that needs to be factored in. Um, for a review, generally we've seen like around $4,000. Audit can be anywhere from eight to $12,000 really. Uh, so it's good to get some quotes or just put in like in an estimate at least so that uh, at the end of the budget, you're not under budgeting for your costs. Uh, the other thing is employer payroll costs. Uh, so on top of gross salary, usually like if this is your first time starting a company, then you might think, okay, if I'm paying someone a gross salary of $60,000, then that's all there is. But as an employer, you're required to contribute CPP and EI to their salary when you're paying them on payroll. So there's usually a cost, I would say around 8% of that, that's kind of uh, added on top of your gross pay. So make sure you're budgeting for that because that is a hard cost that uh, a cash outflow that's required to CRA. Um, and in the budget though, every section has like other payroll cost line and you can just add that cost either in there or right within the cost of the person or, or the, the budget item. Uh, now overhead and contingency are- Excuse me, what was the percent? Sorry, I missed the number. So uh, you mean for the employer? It's around 8%, I would say. It's different by province and each person's tax situation. 
So I think eight to 10 is a good threshold. Perfect, thanks. All right. Um, so it looks like Matt's having some power outage issues. Uh, so I will continue. Uh, so the other thing is the overhead. So overhead is, again, there's a cap on how much overhead you can budget for a project. And it's usually the general rule across both uh, programs is 10% of labor and equipment costs. So that's kind of like a catch all category for any costs that aren't that you're not budgeting for separately. So there's usually a separate budget for like accounting costs for legal fees for insurance. Uh, but and then there's an, an overhead that kind of covers everything else. And there's a 10% cap on that. Again, that's kind of like uh, an amount that's almost fixed in a way in that you can just budget for 10% of the your labor and equipment, and then you can report that as your final cost. There's, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's like a free free to use thing. It's just, uh, it's kind of like a given amount because there's a lot of overhead that's not being captured and each project will have overhead. At least in pre-COVID days, you could count on rent and stuff. Now, maybe not so much, uh, but it's still, that ha hasn't changed. So that's something to factor in. Uh, I don't see any reason not to max that out unless it's a huge project because um, you will have overhead that obviously runs over. Uh, kind of related to that is the contingency, which again is around 10% that you're allowed. Um, and that can be, uh, I guess it's kind of like a buffer that you can put into your project because chances are you're gonna be over a lot of things, especially if this is your first time budgeting, your project is bound to run over cost. So that kind of acts as a buffer that you can use to allocate to another cost that runs over. So let's say if you have labor at 100,000 uh, and then you put in 10,000 of contingency, by the end of the project, the goal is that that contingency of 10,000 is being used up under labor or something else. Because it, when you submit the final cost, there's no contingency. That's not an actual cost. It's supposed to be used up by one of the other items. Uh, equipment costs is another thing. So you can't, just because you buy, purchase an equipment uh, at some point in the project, you can't claim the entire cost purchase cost. It's usually split up over two years normally and claimed monthly. So if you bought like a $2,400 computer right at the beginning, you can claim $100 per month for that as a cost. Uh, if you can't just buy a, a new laptop at the end of the project and claim the entire cost of that. Um, now, in terms of <clears throat> uh, managing your cash flow, uh, obviously that's really nothing we can cover in one slide or even one session. It comes down to keeping on top of your books and your accounting records, making sure your accounting is up to date, which we'll cover in a second. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind though is the auditor and review requirements. So obviously that when you're wrapping up the game, you, you know, you're hitting that last stretch kind of until you release your game, that's when cash really becomes really important. And in most cases, getting that final payment. So CMF and IDM fund are given out in tranches. So you'll have like 50% or 40% of the payment up front, and then another couple of payments throughout the life cycle of the project. Uh, but that last payment, usually it's, let's say 20%, right? And that's obviously that you're going to use that to repay anything you borrowed or any final costs. So that's where you keep in mind that audits and reviews at the end of the project take some time. So make sure you talk to your accounting firm and make sure they're really on board with when you need, when your project's completing so that you they can get started on the audit right away. Because it can take like a month or a month and a half for that process to wrap up. So I would recommend talking to them and making sure they're aware of your reporting deadlines and you can't get the final payment until the audit's done. So make sure you stay on top of them and make sure you plan for that when you're looking at your own cash flow. And again, the financing part we just covered earlier is just like that's another way to, uh, I guess, manage your cash flow really until you get the final payment. Um, Oh, yeah. So quickly, I'll just run through COVID funding because um, we've been talking about this for months. So in terms of like, this was a special year in many ways. So there was a lot of uh, funding that was available that would normally not have been. Uh, I mean, there's obviously 
you know, the market's changed and everything else has changed. So the CMF had a couple of rounds of funding. It was actually uh, the Department of Heritage that gave out the funding, but it was administered or given out through CMF. So they had two rounds of funding, uh, one back in May, I believe, and then another one just that just wrapped up last week. Uh, but it was essentially for either, you could either apply to new companies or companies that were in business for a while and had released a game in the last couple of years. Um, and then there's, as well as that, there's wage subsidies. Uh, again, so the wage subsidies, 75%, up to 75%. That's changed now and it's been extended to June of next year uh, with a maximum of 65%. Um, the SIBA is the $40,000 loan which is now increased to $60,000 and 20,000 of that is now forgivable uh, as long as you meet certain repayment terms. So make, see if you apply for that and oops. And the last one was just, oh yeah, BDC and EDC loans. So again, there are uh, additional financing and loans available from BD, through your bank, but backed by BDC. Uh, so I would, again, talk to your bank, as long as you're in business, when the lockdown started, so before March, you are you could qualify for some of these loans. Okay, so moving on to accounting. Uh, Matt, do you want to start this off, or do you want me to? Sure. Um, so, so cloud accounting, as I mentioned, is something we alluded to at the beginning. It's something a backbone of why we wanted to, to bring tech into accounting. And we really feel that both Zero and QuickBooks Online are two of the, the most important packages out there that are well suited to this industry because of their abilities, uh, especially when it comes to uh, project-based accounting, which is important in our industry because we're always looking at reporting requirements for things like tax credits, CMF. IDMF. So those are the backbones, but there's a lot uh, more to cloud accounting than just these two applications. We see a lot of people using these applications as though it was any sort of desktop application. Go ahead, Manny. Sure. So yeah, uh, the whole point of cloud-based is um, it's everything's like you're expecting things to work in the in 2020. So everything's real time. Like there's no separate accounting software that you have to open up every time you need to check something or run a report. Uh, collaboration, so if you have multi, your producers accessing the same information, your accountant and bookkeepers accessing the same information that everyone else is. And you can run a report from your home or remotely, which is obviously, it seems like you're stating the obvious here, but uh, it's, not, it's not something you take for granted in the world of accounting software. Uh, but the true power of cloud systems are all these add-ons that you can get. So uh, just because Zero and QBO have the basic functionality, you're not limited to that. And you can have an add-on that deals with expense claims, which is, again, something probably more relevant pre-COVID. Uh, but again, if you have employees paying for a lot of their own costs, that makes the whole process reimbursing them for all of those expenses is a lot easier. Then you have add-ons for managing documents. So again, the whole idea of cloud accounting is to go paperless. And there's a few add-ons out here like Receipt Bank that just automate the entire process of handling all your paperwork. So you can have your whole accounting process start to finish without ever dealing with a single piece of paper or receipt or your bookkeeper can do that. Uh, again, that's uh, made easier by things like Receipt Bank, which all connect to your cloud software. Uh, the other big thing is the payroll add-on. So traditionally, what you might have been used to are things like ADP and Ceridian, which are like uh, if you received, if you worked at a large company, that's what you, you get your paycheck from. But again, with cloud accounting, a lot of cloud, smaller cloud payroll providers have come out. And again, the whole benefit of them connecting to QBO and Zero is that all of your accounting information is automatically synced and there's not a lot of manually entering payroll information into your accounting software. It's all done uh, via the cloud. Uh, again, the whole idea of a lot of companies do start uh, doing manual payroll because uh, there are calculation tools out there that where you can just put in the numbers every time and then calculate payroll manually. But given the low cost of some of these payroll providers, I would recommend definitely signing up for them. That way all of the like the manual admin side of payroll is handled. Uh, 
for you, it's like the direct deposits, the calculations, the T4s at your end, uh, uh, pay stubs, all of that is basically automated for you. And then again, time tracking comes into play when you have, when you have to report costs per project or by activity, when you have someone doing multiple roles or multiple projects at the same time, having a time tracking system is key to kind of helps you with the reporting side to split up the costs, but also for tax credits. If you're trying to figure out how much to claim for each project or how much to claim for shred versus uh, some other non-shred activity, that's where time tracking is really key. And again, all of these systems can work together, um, which is great. And that just saves a lot of hassle and back and forth and you know, dealing with the bookkeeper, with the producer, and that way you, more of your time is spent actually on the building of the game versus like the overhead of accounting and bookkeeping. We have a quick question in the chat, Medesser. Um, how about Wave compared to QuickBooks? Sure, okay. So yeah, Wave is <laughs> obviously a pretty appealing option because it's free, which is great. Uh, however, it's, it's kind of like a very bare bones system in terms of true accounting capabilities. Uh, I don't think if you, this is like a single person corporation maybe or like you're just starting out as a freelancer and you're kind of transitioning. We've seen that people who start with Wave often move to quickly outgrow it and they have to move to something uh, more robust like QB or Zero, just because of all of these add-ons. So none of these add-ons are available for Wave. With Wave, you're stuck with using their whole ecosystem. So you have to use Wave payroll and Wave receipts. Uh, and then like, for example, Zero and QB will have like a thousand add-ons. So other apps that can connect to them and you know, enhance their functionality. Whereas with Wave, you're just stuck with Wave. I, I know I get that it's free and it's kind of uh, appealing, but as a, as a base accounting software, it's okay. But I think most companies will outgrow it. It also comes down to, I think, the, the project-based accounting functionalities of it. Um, and that's, that's something I want to just touch on again with, with Zero and QuickBooks here. Um, what I would always recommend is, is that you're essentially setting up your cost categories so that they meet essentially your, your CMF requirements, your IDMF requirements, so that at the end of the project, to fill out that final cost report, you're essentially just pulling a, a period report from your accounting package, and it has each one of the, the costs coded out uh, that would meet your, your uh, CMF uh, budgeting codes. It's much simpler than having to go back and rework that entire budget yourself or having to, to keep track of that separately in the spreadsheet. Therein mm -hmm. lies the differences too between QuickBooks and Xero. Uh, QuickBooks does have basic project uh, project-based accounting functionality where you can code things once, whereas zero, you can code things twice. So now you can track time in two different avenues, perhaps something for a tax credit claim and something for a, a CMF or an IDMF report. Yeah, uh, and, some questions about security as well. So again, it's kind of like the standard level of security you would expect from even your bank, really. It's as secure as your bank in most cases. Uh, again, we've, I've been working with cloud systems for almost 10 years now. And there hasn't been a single incident that I'm, I'm aware of. I know that's not kind of like the conclusive evidence, but of course it's used by millions of people. And again, there's security is here of the art. They realize they're working with financial data here. And in most cases they are connecting to your bank to pull in the bank feeds automatically. So again, security is their primary concern. And I don't think there's any really any issues to be worried about. It's as strong as your banking password, I would say, if not, just as much. Yeah, I think they're, they're both into the same regulations as the bank for security, correct? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, someone, QB Online, again, uh, as much as QB Online is an option, I would never, I don't think we've ever recommended that to our clients. In most cases, we recommend clients to move away from QBO to zero if possible, but in some reasons, clients tend to stick with them, especially if they have a lot it's of- It's a known quantity and a known name. Right. So, yeah, exactly. But I would never, if someone's starting out, I would never recommend QBO just as, yeah. from an accounting point of view. Uh, sorry, why is that? Why you, I miss why you would not recommend? Uh, it's just the, the kind of the whole user experience of QBO. It's just like, because QuickBooks historically has been a desktop software and they're kind of moving a legacy system to the cloud and they're still thinking like, a legacy software. It's not a really cloud-based software. It's just like having an online interface to a desktop software, right? And a lot of it is like the UI is clunky. The whole experience is clunky. In a lot of cases, we've seen like errors, like where a trial balance doesn't balance, which defeats the whole it's terrifying accounting yeah. software, right? 
it's just i mean it's a big name it's into it right it's a billion dollar company but i don't think they're doing it right the way a startup and frankly that's coming from a, a completely um subjective point of view i mean we're partners with both of them we get the same discounts the same treatment with both of them um i think my take on it more so is that zero started in the cloud that that's they based their whole thing on starting in the cloud and wanting to to kind of break the mold of accounting and doing that um quickbooks realized that it was they had they had to catch up so they've been playing catch up ever since then quick into it clearly has the money to do it and they're putting more and more functionality into it it's become much better but there are still some very simple instances which we've never understood why they haven't uh, added i'll give you the most basic one and it's something called transactional level communication so in zero if i want to ask you a question based on one transaction like if you're your receipt is, you don't have a receipt for something, or if the receipt is illeg illegible, or we have no idea what that receipt is for, and we want to ask you a question, we can send you a note within system, comes up on your system in a flag, and you can just address it right there. For some reason, QuickBooks doesn't have that. We would have to email you separately, point to where that transaction is. You're gonna have to go and find that, dig it up. So it's wasting your time, our time, everyone. And it's just, it's such a simple, uh, I'm not a developer, but I would think that that's a simple fix compared to a lot of the other features that they're implementing on it. They just never prioritized it, so. Mm -hmm. uh, someone also asked about cryptocurrencies. <laughs> <laughs> accounting for cryptocurrencies <laughs> we've been dealing with this a lot recently yeah Go so <laughs> it's not really like there's a lot i mean cra obviously this is an emerging field and the government is always a few years behind the market so they're just now getting their heads wrapped around cryptocurrencies so their position is that cryptocurrency is to be considered a commodity or like an investment a stock so it's not every transaction and there are requirements for how uh, each transaction needs to be reported. So there are a couple of online apps that kind of tie together all of your crypto wallets and generate tax reports for CRA. Uh, but again, it's not an easy, it's not a straightforward thing. And most accounting apps like Zero and QBO don't have any support built in for crypto. You need to have a separate platform that connects your wallets and exchanges and pulls in all the required information. It's basically like reporting on an investment. So you have to record when every trade was made every time you bought or sold a crypto or uh, some kind of cryptocurrency so it's it's kind of complicated so that probably it depends on your situation as well and how you're using uh, crypto but it's not considered a form of payment by cra it's considered a commodity that you're trading it's kind of like a barter transaction so that, that's how the, that's their official position on it so it as you can imagine that gets uh kind of messy real quick uh okay so uh, there are a lot of questions i can just uh go through yeah i was gonna say just go through those um cryptocurrencies so fresh books again um it's kind of similar to wave it's more targeted towards freelancers uh and again single person corporations the same issues with wave it's kind of built to be simple and it ends up in sometimes being too simple for an accountant to use so they can generate reports like uh that you need for accounting but unless you're a freelancer or, or you're just a single person doing services through an incorporation i would maybe say not use that and maybe start with something like zero as long as you're having planning to have a company pay, pay staff hire contractors you'll outgrow that pretty quickly uh, and again the same problem of add-ons where it's just fresh books is just fresh books there aren't a lot of other things that connect to it to extend its functionality uh, so yeah, it's kind of in the same boat as Wave, I would say. Uh, difference between QB and QB on. Oh, that's what I just uh, we just discussed. So QuickBooks was originally a desktop software. It would just sit on one computer, and the only way you could access it if you had a computer in your office, if you were right in that terminal and you were accessing it. But QB Online is like the cloud-based version of that. Um, I'm just going up to the top of the chat here. So uh, equipment costs would go under capital equipment costs, CCA. Is that correct? Equipment costs. Okay, CCA is a CRA term. Yeah, so CCA is essentially how you're right. It's a it's a tax term for amortization of equipment costs, but they don't go under CCA. Normally, they would when you're filing your taxes, but for if you're preparing a cost report for CMF or IDMF, then there's a separate line for equipment costs by type of equipment. 
uh, computer workstations is the most common one. And so you would basically amortize that cost uh, over two years and whatever months are you were doing the project, you would report only those months as uh, the equipment cost. Uh, next question here. Yeah, if that doesn't, Natalie, definitely reach out to us. We can clarify. Next question is uh, working with IDM and it being rejected a couple of times and a question regarding the transparency. Uh, yeah, that, that definitely is an issue with uh, Ontario Creates. Uh, I know Lucy can probably speak to that as well. It is it's something what we'd all like to see. We'd like to see similar transparency with IDM and Ontario Creates that we see with, uh, with uh, CMF where you can see the judging panel. You can even reach out to them. They'd have to recuse themselves. Um, I'm not sure, Lucy, is that gonna be a topic at this, this upcoming session of? of... Uh, in fact, uh, this has been raised because Ontario Creates is reviewing its programs and processes this year. Uh, so we already had so, some focus groups where this was raised and we will continue to push on them for more transparency. So more to come over the next few months. Okay, perfect. Um, final payment you mean from founders? Funders, yeah, I think someone Funders, thank you. To that. It says okay. final, yeah. So what I meant right, was yeah. like, because the CMF or IDM fund payments are given out in like tranches, you get the final payment is like a 20% usually that's paid out way at the end after your, your project's closed and the audit and review have been done. I'm just going through a lot of these have been answered in here correctly. Yeah. We, uh, we covered security, the crypto and fresh books. So fresh books, I don't know if you covered, but very similar to Wave, even more so aimed at at indies, at independent um, freelancers and whatnot. And fresh books has always uh, structures themselves to be in that in that sense. Uh, same thing, uh, connectivity to Receipt Bank and the others uh, is is just not available. Uh, fresh books also isn't free, so fresh books is really a small uh, discount over uh, a basic version of something like Zero or QuickBooks. No, in which, some cases I think fresh books is USD, so it's almost more expensive than QBO. And almost as sometimes yeah. even more expensive than zero. Yeah, I think the last I looked at was 19 USD, which is very comparable. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, do these options assist with MIDIC book entries? Oh, no, we missed one. Uh, useful add ons for QuickBooks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think the most useful one that I would recommend to everyone is Receipt Bank because. Uh, yeah, so I'll touch on that a little bit too, because I talk about, I usually spend a lengthy amount of time talking about that, because to me, Receipt Bank is almost more important than, than Zero and QuickBooks itself. Without Receipt Bank, uh, Zero and QuickBooks effectively are just a desktop solution with uh, your, your bank feeds plugged in. So Receipt Bank to me is, is excellent for gaming because it uh, captures a number of different things that suit the industry well without being overburdensome for something like expense claims. So like any other app, and there are a number out there, you snap a picture of a receipt, it extracts the data, it feeds it into both Zero and QuickBooks and merges it with your bank feeds, reconciles everything behind the scenes. It is remarkably accurate compared to the other ones that we've worked with, um, something we're always testing out because it's something we use internally. But further to that, it's not just taking a, a photo of your seat. Of course, it's, it's um, you have the ability to forward emails in. Um, what I love most about Receipt Bank is this feature that they used to call Fetch. I'm not sure if they're calling it Fetch anymore, but essentially what it does is, especially in, the, in this industry, we've got so many invoices, statements that we're logging into, or at least we should log into and pull a PDF for uh, like an Adobe subscription on a periodic basis. Take that PDF, store it on Google Drive so it's there if we need it in the future for an audit for review. Uh, what Receipt Bank will do is it will take your login credentials, log into most of those, not all of them, but most of them behind the scenes, pull that PDF statement, um, again, take, extract the data, merge it with the bank feeds, and store a copy of that right within Zero, right within QuickBooks. So at the time of reporting, you always have that image stored right in those files. Uh, one other functionality that I love about Receipt Bank is its ability to act as a very lightweight expense, man personal expense, reimbur personally reimbursable expense management platform. And by that, I mean, essentially, you can have Receipt Bank on everybody's phone, on everybody's computers in the company. Um, if they are putting something through Receipt Bank that doesn't link to one of the company credit cards, one of the company bank cards, it'll automatically attribute it to their personal expense. Um, and it'll sit there as an expense claim within Receipt Bank. You can push that into zero into QuickBooks so that receipt 
that uh, reimbursable expense claim is sitting there again, perfectly documented with an image of the receipt. And you can either, if it's your own as an owner, you can do with that what you may. You can leave it sitting there as a shareholder loan. If it's an employee, you can pay out that expense claim at any point in time or add it onto payroll. So it's servicing multiple areas at the same time for a, a very moderate price. I think it's $15 at the lowest price point. Uh, this is a minute book question, Medesser. Yeah, I just uh, responded to a couple of questions because I know we're running out of time. So I just yeah, we are. To them in the chat. Good, good call. Uh, there was a question about our fees and then about minute books. Okay. Um, and then grants like IDM, are they considered income? Yeah. So this is something we didn't discuss. Treatment of, of uh, CM, CMF and IDM. You want to yeah. talk about that briefly? Sure. That's... So IDM is the easier one. So because it's considered a non-repayable contribution, it is considered revenue for tax purposes. Uh, however, the tricky thing that comes up is what if you get IDM right before the end of your fiscal year, right? And then you haven't actually spent any costs or expenses on the project yet. Uh, that's where you have to watch out and make sure that you're deferring the revenue correctly so that you're not reporting a huge revenue in the first year without having expenses and having to pay tax on that. So it is revenue, but it needs to be uh, recorded as revenue in the right periods. Yeah, so it's, it's common in an industry, it's both with CMF, it's also with things like publisher advances. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could get a publisher advance just before the end of your fiscal year. That's, depending on how that's structured, more often than not, that's structured so that it's meant to be spent on expenses to build the game, which could happen in the uh, rolling over to the next fiscal period. So you want to make sure your accountant's not looking at, you know, any money in as revenue, um, therefore possibly taxable. And CMF normally in the production phase, because it's an investment, it wouldn't be revenue for you. It's just like somebody you borrowing money from someone or investing into your company. Uh, so that should not be considered revenue. Uh, there's an argument to be made for either side, but I would say it's not revenue. Uh, no blow here. What business friendly accounting courses? Uh, I have to think about that money. Maybe we can think about that. I'm not sure. Um, what courses? I know Zero has a ton of stuff online. I don't know if it's to do with accounting itself or just to do with its software, but we can definitely get back to you on that side. Okay. Um, is a tax credit only for employees? What if the partners didn't get paid and then invest in the equipment? So yeah, for most, for both of the tax credits we talked about, YDMTC and Shred, they're both labor-based. So if you hire employees or subcontractors, you can get a credit on the expenses on that, but you don't get to get any uh, refund on equipment cost anymore. It's only strictly labor-based. Yeah. Okay, I am. Um really not enjoying having to interrupt people at the end of things like this. Oh, no, I think we're going so well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clearly, there's a lot of interest and a lot of knowledge sharing, and I love it. And thank you so, so much for, for being here to do this and, and to help people uh, get the 101. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, for everybody who wants to continue chatting uh, with Insert Coin, please contact them. They're here for you. <laughs> and um, I have a couple of announcements that I want to make for Interactive Ontario if you're interested. Uh, first of all, the um, Interactive Digital Media Directory can be found on interactiveontario.com. Uh, you will find Insert Coin on the directory there, so you'll be able to, to connect with them and um, and uh, other IDM companies. If you are not on there yourself, please let us know so that we can add you to it. Uh, the, in the first week of November, we have a couple of events coming up. We have um, the next town hall. Uh, for those of you who have never been to our town hall, there is quite a bit of discussion on the emergency funding. Um, and so a lot of information that was touched on today with um, the tax credits and things like that is something that's often covered in our town halls. So you are welcome to join us for those. The next one is November 3rd. Uh, and on the following day, November 4th, will be the next eye lunch. Uh, so please keep in touch with us and we're happy to, um, to continue having uh, our eye lunch series and having you all here with us. Thank you, that was awesome. Thank you for bearing with me in the technical. One thing I've never <laughs> forecasted is, is power outages and two power outages at the oh same time. Oh my God. 
So <laughs> the, the fun part of Zoom I lunches. I hope you all enjoyed yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, um, everybody. Uh, and Hannah for, for helping us put it all together Pleasure. this year for, for being here to do this. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll have a recording out being, being shared um, and also ending up to, to send out the presentation as well. That would be great. For sure. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Lucy Sarah. All right. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye.